Thank you so much for being here. Wow, thank you so much for having me. <laughs> this is like really, really exciting, ladies. I am just thrilled to be able to introduce a fantastic friend of mine. Uh, another one, you're, you know, what I really love about this is that my listeners and my community and my tribe are really starting to get an inside peek to my to my friendships because I've been uh, interviewing several of my friends lately. And uh, it's fun because I really want my listeners and audience to, to feel held and to feel like they're a part of something bigger and to feel like they're a part of something really amazing, which my friends are. Thank you very much. <laughs> so I'm just thrilled to be able to introduce you to Dr. Diane Mueller. She, like I said, is a great friend of mine, but she does incredible work in the world. I actually lean into her sometimes when I need doctor advice because she's got so much wisdom and so much knowledge. She's the co-founder of Medicine with Heart and Medicine with Heart Institute with her husband, Dr. Miles Nichols, who is also an amazing, amazing man in this world. Medicine with Heart is their clinical practice and the Medicine with Heart Institute is an online certification school that trains practitioners around the world in functional medicine using, using the Medicine with Heart method. As a survivor of mold and illness and mold illness, Lyme disease, fibromyalgia, and so many things. And she's going to go into all of this with you because her story is really incredible. Dr. Diane Muller knows firsthand what it's like to struggle to the point of not knowing how to survive the day. And as you know, this is the story that I like to talk about because we, we all have challenge and ladies, I just want you to know, it doesn't matter what your challenge is, what you're struggling with, what is up for you and what seems to be in your way. You can too, you can too. And so I'm really excited for Dr. Diane to share this information with you. She has gone through her own struggle. She has um, overcome all those things and she's counseled hundreds of others to do the same, inspired her, it, this, all this inspired, inspired her to co-create medicine with heart method, which is a mind body approach to functional medicine. It's such an, an innovative, beautiful way to work. And it just really aligns with all the conversations that we've been having over the past couple of years. So she is relentless in working to shift the paradigm of medicine by educating a new breed of doctors. She and her team speak around the world and have been on Fox News, many podcasts, and have been keynote speakers at national conferences. The focus of her work is on wellness through advanced diagnostics and through looking at personal motivational strategies of the individual to encourage personal empowerment through education. So, um, ah, welcome Dr. Diane Miller. <laughs> Thank you for being here. I'm so excited to be here with you and your community today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. It's a, it's a joy to be able to bring such brilliance and wisdom to, to my listeners and help people understand that, you know, um, like I said earlier, we all have struggles, you know, and, and maybe it's a struggle because we seemed locked into our story of what life is like on this planet right now, whatever that is for you. And, and what I know is that we can all rise up. Women have so much power to really like drop into their center of power and to really like be a receiver of change and be a receiver of, of openness and wisdom and movement and spirit and grace into our lives. And we are the power that changes the world. So you are in the forefront of this and I just cannot wait to hear more about your story today. Well, thank you. I'm so excited to share and I appreciate so much just the work you're doing and everybody that's on this you know, that's listening to this information, my sense has been that you have a community of warriors. So I'm so grateful to be part of what you have brought to the world here. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Well, you're a great adjunct to it. And you, I have to say, inspire me all the time. So, so my brilliance is your brilliance. Thank you, mama. <laughs> yes, <no> sister. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome. It's awesome. Yeah. Sweet. So, you know, um, how about you just kind of share with us a little bit about how you got here? Yeah, happy to happy to. So as you, you know, kind of mentioned in the introduction, I've had a wide variety of health issues. So it started when, I, I believe it started when I was in undergrad, I started having all this elbow pain and I ended up having to have elbow surgery. And that was like the first thing that was like, oh, I'm 19. Why am I suffering with this elbow pain? 
Um, but it wasn't like a huge deal at that point. But then I started to have a lot of symptoms that were worsening and scary stuff. Like at the height of it, I would leave my house. I was always committed to going to a walk, even if it was only like two to five minutes, because oftentimes that's literally all I could do. But I would always try to at least like walk, you know, one way up the block and one way down the block, you know, and my just to get my lymphatics moving, just to kind of help my mindset because it was so, you know, there's so much depression and feeling continually bad. And in the height of it, I would go for these walks and occasionally be just like, you know, I could practically see my house. I was so close to my house, but I would forget completely where I was. Like I would get lost. I would completely forget where I would live. It was like, I would call them episodes and All of a sudden, you know, I would go into this episode and I would get confused and lost and overwhelmed. And that would last for generally just a few minutes. It wasn't like a huge, long, you know, long period of time. And then this wave would clear. And then all of a sudden I was like, oh, this is this is where I am in space. This is where I live. Okay, everything's okay." But it would happen sometimes when I would be driving and I have to pull over, you know, in my car and you know, this sort of thing. So it was getting like to a point where it was like, wow, this is getting a little dangerous, you know? And so what ended up happening is I started getting a lot of lab testing done and nothing was, nothing was solving it. Nothing was solving it at all. And eventually I I ended up graduating. I was in medical school, naturopathic medical school while this was going on. And I graduated and my friends and colleagues everybody was starting to feel like non-fatigued and it was kind of written off when I was in school, like oh, it's just medical school fatigue. You're studying all night. You know, it, it is what it is. And then when my friends started getting better and I started getting worse, that's kind of when I knew that there was something more serious happening there. And, you know, the height of it, like when I was going through this, there was like another couple of things that I think are worth mentioning here that I was so, discombobulated in my mind and in my thinking process and in my self-talk. This was definitely a big point of very negative self-talk for me around like, how can I be successful in life? I'm going to fail. I'm never going to be well. Story after story after story. And in the middle of all of this, I ended up in a very, um, very damaging relationship, which ended up being physically abusive. At one point I was thrown against the wall and held there and, um, you know, was just screaming, let me go, let me go. And, you know, there's a whole story of how I got out of that scenario. But, you know, one of the points why I've been telling and sharing that part of the story more and more is because I really feel like what we're talking about, what you've been talking about on these episodes, what we're talking about today around mind and around our thought process is it's something that is true for humans. You know, whether whether we've gone through periods mm-hmm. of stress with our health or stress with our marriage or stress with our career or stress with our childhood, it, there's there's things that as humans, we all have gone through and there's things in our mind that we all need to work on. And I think the more we normalize this and say like, hey, it's a human thing to have an untrained mind until we learn how to train it is so, so important. It's so true. Yeah. So, so yeah, so that's like, you know, that's kind of the basics of, you know, the struggle. And then from there, I said, once I got tested for Lyme and mold illness, and I had about a half dozen other infections in me and liver problems, and, you know, it was just like a grocery list of a lot of things. Yeah. And doing all the physical things that you and I know how to do, you know, treating with supplements, working on diet, all of those things were amazing foundations. And I truly believe that I would not be better without those things. And I also really believe with what I, you know, I've seen in myself and with my clients that a huge part of my recovery was also working on the internal dialogue, you know, my internal belief that I I could be successful, that I was going to heal, that I was not going to live this way forever, you know, that I would be able to get out of bed and have normal days. And we really see even in research that when we work on our thoughts, 
it changes our cortisol. It changes our stress hormone. And when we change our stress hormone, we actually change our immune system function and we change our, you know, sex hormone function, all of these things. So, you know, it's so cool that now research is finally catching up a little bit more with what, you know, I think the human experience has already showed and revealed. Sure. Sure. Yeah. And how old were you again, when you were having those episodes where you would be far away from home and I was in my twenties. So it home, started. But... Yeah. Yeah. Near, near my home. It started around 25 ish or so. It was mid twenties. Wow. How long did that last for you? Until about, it was about 33 when I kind of was like completely resolved from wow. that I'm, and I'm 40 now. And that was the mold toxicity specifically. It was a combination of mold and Lyme. So I had a period in there where I had treated the Lyme and I was out of a moldy house and things were, you know, fairly good. So I had this good period in there for about a year where like, oh, I was really, really making progress. And then I moved into another, into a different house that had mold in it. And um, I didn't do my due diligence. You know, this is like me making my own personal mistake around like, testing the house for mold prior to living in there. And um, I didn't do that. And, and I was fine for the first many months, but after a, a certain period of time, then my symptoms started creeping back and never got as bad as they did originally. Cause I knew what to watch out for. Um, but I could start seeing some of the dissociation and the brain fog and those kind of things return. Wow. And I'm sure, I mean, I know you see so many patients and I'm curious how many patients do you see that come to you that are like, Hey, I'm having these weird experiences, be them episodes like you had or forgetfulness, or they feel like they're aging faster than they should be, or something's not right, but they can't put their finger on it. And is this a common thing for you? It's really common. I mean, genetically, so genetically with mold, Basically, a lot of people have a misunderstanding with mold that it's like, oh, it's like an allergy, right? But when mm -hmm. with mold illness, what we're really talking about is a genetic anomaly where we do not, because of our genes, we don't actually recognize the toxin that mold produces. So if we're in a moldy place, we inhale the toxin. What's supposed to happen is our liver is like, oh, it's that toxin, this guy, get that guy out of here. But yeah. with this genetic, you know, what happens is like the, the immune system is, it just ignores that the toxin exists. And then it builds up and builds up. So that genetic is actually estimated to affect 24% um, of the population, like a lot of people. And so not everybody with the gene has that gene expressed, but it is the gene is, you know, very common to, to have. And so in my practice, probably, I bet it's probably 50% if I were to actually pull charts, 50% um, of people we wind up treating for mold illness. Wow. wow. Very, That's very big. common. And, and in a chronic disease situation where people are struggling to get well, it's very, very common that it's, you know, mold as a component of it. Wow. That's very cool. It's cool to know that. So yeah. I'm curious, you know, one of the things we had discussed earlier is how people stay stuck in a health loop and don't achieve their goals. Can you kind of like, cause I feel like this kind of like ties into that conversation. Can we? Absolutely. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, there's a couple different reasons why I see people getting, you know, stuck in this loop. One is just simply not knowing that there's additional information out there, right? That's what's so amazing about this work that you're doing is just letting the world know, you know, that there's, there's additional information because so many times like mold illness is starting to make its way uh, more into, you know, major, um, practices. For example, I have a client who said she was being treated for mold illness by Cleveland Clinic. So that was like the first I had heard around like, oh, this type of information is really making its way into, you know, these more mainstream mediums, which is really, really good for, you know, for the consumer and for the public. So one reason is just purely from not realizing that there is, you know, other information and help out there. But putting that aside, let's say that people have heard of, you know, heard of alternative root causes, have heard of alternative solutions, and have even gone that direction and are still stuck in that loop. One of the main reasons why I see this happens 
is because people are, it's because some, of something to do with the minds. You know, we can do mm-hmm. all of the, and I see this over and over. And I know, you know, I, I know like the work that you do, it's so predominant with getting into the subconscious and working on those you know, thoughts and those subconscious programs. And it's just so amazing what I see when we actually go into and we, we look and we say, okay, here's, here's what happens when we actually look at the thought process, right? And so one of the things why, one of the reasons why I see people get caught in the loop is largely when I actually see people having these thought processes like I've described around, I will not be well, I will not be well, life is so hard. And again, it's normal to have you know, negative thought processes, especially when we haven't learned how to train our thoughts to be different. And we haven't been told that we can actually train our, ourselves to have positive thoughts um, and these sorts of things. So, and I think a lot of it really comes down to this mechanism that I'm talking about is when we're having these negative thoughts, you know, what happens if I, if I internally close my eyes right now and say, I'm a failure or say, I'm never going to be well, I actually, I can start feeling my heart racing like a little bit more, you know, my adrenaline's going and this type of thing. And when our adrenaline's pushing and pumping, we're not in a state of healing. Our body's not in a state of repair. And I think that's why we get stuck in these cycles is we work so much on the physical, which is so important, so important. We absolutely need to work on the physical. But if we haven't spent time working on how to cultivate stress resilience, on how to keep ourselves calm when the world around us is just, you know, crazy. And COVID is like a perfect example of like this year around like, there's a lot we can't control in this world. And if we haven't started working on that, I think it's really easy to get stuck in this loop because the moment we feel stress, our adrenaline goes up, our cortisol goes up and our systems of healing and repairing just crash. Yeah, this is a, this is a a problem right now, you know, Um, you know, and I, I hear you. Yeah. You know, like, you know, me, I'm, I'm way into like consciousness first, really. I I think, I mean, obviously the physical matters because we're in a physical body and you got to address both, but like you, if I had only taken supplements and never addressed my mindset, I certainly would probably not be alive right now, you know? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And, but, and in today's world, like, and I do, I do a really good job of insulating myself from the media. I don't, I don't, I haven't left my house in a long time and I don't watch TV and I don't peruse social media. Like I really insulate myself really well. And I felt myself today, even today, and I've, I've overcome like extreme panic and anxiety. Like that's not really a part of my reality, but lately I've kind of felt it kind of coming back. And, and then today, this morning I woke up and I was like in this panic state. And it was just because a friend of mine had sent me this video and it's not only because of that, but they sent me this video and I hadn't watched it for days and days. Cause I just don't watch that stuff. Right. And I'm pretty sure that it was something bad, (laughs) not bad, but not in alignment with what the system wants us to think. Right. So, so I felt ready this morning and I watched it. It was only five minutes after that. I literally was so panicky that I was like, okay, I have to do my practice right now because this is not who I like. This isn't mine. This is ridiculous that I'm feeling this way. I have no reason to feel this way. I'm my life is amazing and I'm feeling this way. And then I, I went in my practice and I expanded out and I'm like, oh, so many people are feeling this way. And I'm picking up on even up here. I feel so insulated up here on the mountain and, and I'm still like, oh, there's so much tension right now in the world. And I'm, I'm vibing with that, you know? So do you, does that make sense? And if so, how, how do you deal with that? Oh, it makes so much sense. I mean, that's what I've been telling my husband for, you know, with the state of the world right now, almost every day, like, it's so easy for me to even just go outside also in my mountain home and feel the intensity of, you know, of the world. And, and it's such an interesting time right now, because we, it's always unknown, right? We all, every morning we wake up pre-COVID, during COVID, post-COVID, and it's always unknown what's going to happen in our day. But I think one of the things that's currently happening right now is like, there is so much unknown, so much unknown in the economy and the politics and everything else. And it's not that it wasn't there before. It's now it's like, 
in our face, (laughs) you know? And, you know, for me, I feel like one of the things with like social media is like, I don't get on social media and, and watch like, you know, the media in general, news or any of that very often either. I do use social media for marketing. And so sometimes I'm popping on there. But what's so interesting to me is, you know, fibromyalgia chat group, for example, like a lot of people are posting about their struggles there. But in their general feed, most people are largely posting about what is good in their life. And I think one of the biggest challenges with that is like, it's so easy to really go in there and start comparing our lives to this person that is like, oh, everything's wonderful and everything's perfect. And that's a real big recipe for creating unhappiness. So, you know, most of the time I, you know, I deal with this by also avoiding as much as possible. But then I really have been working a lot lately with like gratitude exercises. And if I feel triggered by somebody talking about oh how easy life is and all of that, then I immediately work on going into gratitude and like really focusing on, I'm grateful for my friends. I'm grateful for my husband. I'm grateful for my house. I'm grateful I have a meal. And that's been a strategy that's really helped me navigate it. Mm, I love that. Yeah. Gratitude is one of those things that can easily turn things around, right? Yeah. Quickly, quickly. It really is a powerful thing. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I, I do that too. Right now it's how am I right right now I'm playing with on a day-to-day basis. How is it that I was supported today? How is it that I was supported today? And, And in there, there's gratitude, obviously, you know, but I think, you know, like you're saying, when we start to really become conscious of our mindset, become conscious of those thoughts that are flowing in and flowing out and just kind of on automatic pilot, they're in the background, running our life, causing us to see life through rose colored glasses as if that were true. Exactly. And we're not conscious of that. We're just going to be like hitting up against our walls and feeling like a victim and feeling like we're not good enough or worthless or whatever your story is around it. Right. So I love, I love your, um, I love your uh, gratitude practice. I'm going to make sure that I have that a little bit, a little bit tighter in my world, especially well, in the world. Frame too. Like, how am I supported for, you know, for today? I think that we're in a, you know, a phase where it just feels, can feel so much like so many people sometimes need us. Right. And so I think reflecting at the end of the day around like, oh, these are the ways that the world is showing up for me. These are the ways that I'm supported. Like, I think that's so beautiful. I'm going to also add that into my practice. (laughs) (laughs) Nice. Nice. And so I'm kind of feeling like maybe this is what you're talking about when you talk about the new paradigm for health and medicine. Is that it? Or is there something more to that? It really is. It really is. Like, I feel like, you know, with functional medicine, which we both practice, like we've started doing a lot and and medicine has started, you know, slowly opening up more and more to the idea that the body works holistically and that we can have an infection in our gut and we have zero gut symptoms, but we have a migraine, for example, so that everything is connected. And there's, that's great. We're making a lot of progress there, but the new paradigm that I'm talking about is exactly this, where we're, we still have this thing in medicine where it's like the body's over here and the mind's over here. And like, it's all working together. So the new paradigm is really in saying like, okay, like, yeah, we can work on all this body stuff and do all the things that we know are so good for the body, but we need to really be working on mindset and, and we're calling it these days, we're calling it mind training or mind hacking, you know, right. really learning how to, um, to actually use our mind as a tool instead of as a, you know, as a thorn basically. Mm, mm, so good. So good. This is kind of bringing something up for me. I, I would like to kind of talk about with you because you have such a beautiful insight on things. So, you know, with this new paradigm, of health and medicine, you know, we're talking about in a true integration, integrative approach of, 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 of working on all aspects of the well being, right? And in our, as you know, in our society, we're trained like deeply, deeply trained that take a pill, make it better. And when the symptoms gone, you're well. And um, <laughs> I'm curious how you approach patients because I know for me, pretty much every single patient I have the conversation with, you know, two to three months in, they start feeling better with those original symptoms that they came in with. And you and I know that they've probably got at least two to three times that much more time of doing this work before they're actually well, otherwise they're going to 
have symptoms return and they're not going to reach that level of wellness they're actually looking for. But since their symptoms are gone, they're like, Oh, I'm done. Right. I'm like, well, if you were going to a medical doctor, you might be done. Um, let's talk about this. And so it's a conversation I have sometimes multiple times with individual patients because it's because they're not trained to understand that we're not suppressing symptoms. We're nourishing the body back to health and for regeneration that takes time. Right. So how do you, how do you talk to patients about that? I mean, similarly, it sounds like to you, it's like, this is the million dollar thing. I feel like is we've been so trained in our society. Like you said, of like pale symptoms, you know, so easy that I think there's so much need for like profound education and reminding people of the great importance of doing the, the mindset and the mindfulness type of training. And largely, I feel like it's a couple different things. I mean, one, continuing to tell people throughout the process that this is important. And sometimes we find that people just are not ready for that yet. It's like it's mm-hmm. sometimes we get people in our practice that they're just not ready to work on the mind yet. And that's, you know, it, it is like something that I think is important to realize it might be where people are at, like they're not ready to do the deep work yet. But I think there, you know, the the thing that we really are passionate about at our office is um, what we call extreme transparency. And so I have let people go out of our clinic before where it's like they're not willing to do this, the mindset and being very honest with like, this is the key to unlocking everything in addition to all the physical stuff. But this is kind of like the hidden key. And it really puts us at a point where I think we reach a wall. And so I really feel like the best things to do is just continue to educate people, remind them, remind them, remind them, remind them, because this is new and we all need to hear this multiple times before we get it. The other thing that I've seen um, to be helpful is to approach it from like, just try this on, like basically like, let's try for one month commit to doing this mind, you know, mindset training practice every day, which for us is usually like a combination of gratitude, exercise, breath work, and meditation. And so, you know, just having people commit to whatever they can, if it's 60 seconds a day, and that's what they can commit to great. If it's 10 minutes a day, great, but making a time that they feel like in the month, like is going to be, they're going to be successful at, even when they have like the days where it's like, everybody's running around and it's just chaos. We want to choose a time where it's like, okay, even if it's 60 seconds on the hardest day of your month, we're still going to get that in. So that it's really programming the, you know, the mind to have success and not to say like, well, I don't have 20 minutes today, so I'm going to toss it. And, you know, and really, you know, using that as almost a trial and say like, let's just try this. Let's see what happens for 30 days. Can you commit to 30 days? And then using, like, we've just started using um, Oxford Happiness Challenge as a monitor of this, of doing like this, you know, this research-based questionnaire at day one, doing a research-based questionnaire at day 30, and to see, like, just like how we lab test, like, let's see, do you actually report a higher happiness score after committing to this after 30 days? And of course, people do. And then it's like easy to have more motivation around like, oh, there's something to this. So that's a helpful tool. And, you know, like anything, I do think it is effort and people do have to be willing to put in a little bit of effort, but it's so life-changing that I think once people see that it's easier to stick with. Absolutely. I agree with you. And I love the way that you have, like, you're really data-driven, you know, you're more data-driven than I am. And I'm just like, wow, she's got all these like tools to see the data of the outcomes of their work. And it's just amazing to be able to see that on a happiness scale. That's, that's cool. (laughs) Yeah, totally. Totally. It's motivating, right? (laughs) Yeah, it really is. And so, you know, with the quote unquote effort that goes into doing these kinds of practices, how does, how do you balance doing and being in one's world? Yeah. So it's, it's one of my favorite questions to talk about these days or topics to talk about these days, because I feel like in work, in life, in business, like from a, you know, feminine masculine standpoint, like the masculine energy and we as females all have masculine energy. When we say masculine and feminine, as I know, you know, it's just, it's just ways of talking about and 
um, putting names to the way we behave in life. So we all have this masculine energy and feminine energy and the masculine energy of doing is, you know, is kind of where I feel like the, even the feminist movement really got started around like, you know, going and pushing and pushing and pushing and being and being in this world where we just are constantly driving. And there's absolute value to that. But the feminine energy is the energy that is more about receiving, you know, it's the energy that allows us to say, let me actually take a step back. Let me actually go into the doing from a balanced state. And let me actually calm and take enough of a break in my day where I can be allow for creative inspiration to come through. Mm. And then, you know, allow movement into the doing from this like heart based you know, type of space. So it's really interesting, again, with like the data, when we look at like data around meditating and productivity, when we're in this state of meditating, of doing our gratitude exercises and all of this, what winds up oftentimes happening is we get this inspiration and from a research-based perspective, we actually get more done. And this is one of the things that people often are surprised about is that oftentimes people don't want to do research or what they don't want to meditate. I mean, because they don't want to take the time away from the doing, from the tasking and all that. But we actually yeah. see that when we do that, when we spend time in being, we actually, from a research driven perspective, we actually are more productive in the doing. So I think this is a really important conversation, you know, around like, Hey, it's like, it's good to do all, all the, all these things, right? It's good to task. It's good to produce in the world. It's good to do all these things, but we can actually be more effective at our doing if we also spend time in our being and, and there's also research to support this. So this is so cool too. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. You're, you're absolutely right. I mean, I see it in my own life for sure. And obviously I, I help people have a little bit more space in their life so that they can be, but for me, it's a, it's a, it, it's a daily challenge even today <laughs> for me to like slow down and get my practice in and chant and meditate and breath and, you know, all the things and, and more and more now I can feel that even with the challenge of it, I can feel like my soul needs me to be still more now than ever. Yes. Like now just be still. And, and, you know, for all you ladies that, that feel that inside of yourself and you're like, but I got my kids and I got to go to pick this up and I got to go to the grocery store and I got to make dinner and I got to do all these things and na, 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 na. And like Dr. Diane saying here, is there a way to find 60 seconds, two minutes, yeah. five minutes, just to stop and take a deep breath and feel the breath move through your body to reset yourself for the next thing that you're going into. Otherwise you'll be, you know, like, oh, 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 why is my life so terrible? And not really giving yourself space to hear the answer to that question, right? Oh yeah. And I think what you're saying here is so, so, so important because one of the things I'm hearing and what you're sharing is like, this is, it's not like we get to a point with our being and our meditation where it's like, oh, everything is zen and peaceful. Like, yeah. you know, I still have moments too. It's like yesterday I found myself like so overwhelmed and, you know, and I started crying and I was just feeling really, really overwhelmed with my life. And I ended up taking a couple moments and doing breath work. And, and it was really, really hard for me to like motivate myself to do that. So you know, I, I think it's so important for people to realize like this is if you're, you know, if you're struggling with like, how am I going to fit this in? And it's so hard. Like we've been doing this, you know, I know both of us for decades and it's still challenging, but it's, you know, it's so it's important, I think, to bring up. It's like just because it's challenging doesn't mean that it's not possible. And just because it's challenging doesn't mean and, you, you know, we, we skip a day because we're so frazzled. It's okay. The next day is a new day. And it doesn't mean that we can't step into this, you know, in our new day, there's always a new opportunity for stepping into this. That's right. That's exactly right. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. And, thank you for that too. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I mean, you know, you know, I, I appreciate your, your expression of, you don't just get there one day and life is all Zen. I mean, it's, it's really a matter of, uh, how do I want my life to be in this moment? <laughs> yeah. And I'm frazzled and I'm crying and I feel let down and I'm emotional and I'm all, I'm all on my own, whatever your story is. Right. 
And, you know, just, I just, in my yoga class today, my yoga teacher was like, you know, the, the one thing that we have, like the one thing we have control over is our thoughts. So, you know, yeah. And what else is it you would like to embody and how are you going to create that? You know, I love your, your commitment to taking a two to five minute walk because that's all you can do. I get not being able to do, you know, when my body was, was ill too, I wasn't able to do, but to, to just, just to be able to commit to, and you have a very strong, clearly for years, you've had a very strong practice to at least giving yourself just a few minutes, just a few minutes. And I, and I have to imagine that that's just um, really enhanced who you are as a person today. Oh, absolutely. You know, this kind of stuff is life changing. And I think, I think I was reflecting in the shower this morning about what I feel like is different now than 2004 is like really when I like was my first year of kind of dedicating to my thought process practice. Mm. So it's been going on 17 years still. The thing that I've noticed that is like remarkable is what is actually, how, how long I get stuck there, right? So even though I still can go through challenging times, the biggest thing that I've noticed is I don't get stuck there as long and I don't go down like the vicious cycle of like circular thinking rabbit hole as deep as I used to. Awesome. So it's, we're always works in progress, but it's cool yeah. to be able to say, okay, this is still normal to have stuff to work on, but yeah. it slowly does, you know, improve and leads to a better quality of life. Yeah. 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 Yay. <laughs> Yay. So all of that. <laughs> but yeah. I imagine you've noticed the same with your practice. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, you know, the days of locking my door and hiding my head in a container of Ben and Jerry's for the reason straight and not answering my phone no longer exist in my life. <laughs> I know those old days. <laughs> right. Oh yeah. No, thanks. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, and that's a testimony, right. And I, you know, I really like to invite all, all the listeners out there, all you ladies to, really just look back on how far you've come from where you've been, because even though we may be in a struggle right now, like it might be really challenging right now. It is really challenging for so many people right now. And if you can just look back and go, you know what? Five years ago, two years ago, one year ago, 10 years ago, I was in this place and look how far I've come. It really helps you just recognize that, oh, you actually do have power to change and you've been doing it long and then you can just tap into that because it's always there for you yeah absolutely I mean I think that's such a good point too is like one of the things that I know both of us see in medicine is that the brain has a natural attendant it's like our brain is like our survival mechanism in part right it like it wants us to survive so we have a tendency in our brain to always be looking for like what's wrong what do I need to improve what do I need to improve and yeah. You know, I see the classic example of what I, of, of how I've seen this. I had a woman come to my, my clinic, her number one symptom was her face was tingling and um, she had a lot of other things, but her number one thing was like her face would just tingle all the time. And we, it was like so simple to stop this for her. It was just like, we stopped gluten. And that was the only thing we tried initially. She comes back three weeks after stopping this and she starts listing off all the symptoms, all of her symptoms on how nothing has improved. And I asked her, I'm like, well, how about your face tingling? And she's like, Dr. Diane, I forgot all about that. It was her number one system, right? And this we see all the time because the brain orients to what is wrong. So, Mm -hmm. you know, what you're mentioning here for the listeners, I think is so valuable because it can be so easy to work on our thoughts and do all these things. And we think that, gosh, I'm still having destructive thoughts. It's not working. It's not working. It's not working. When actually it's just that our brain is continually trying to help us by attuning to what's wrong, that sometimes we can actually get lost and we don't even realize how much we have grown. Yeah. Yeah. That's so true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 We've all made progress. I'm sure of that in some way. <laughs> yeah. Oh, goodness. And so I'm curious, you know, I would love to hear your uh, story around bringing more feminine energy into the world, into the workplace, into life itself. Cause I know we, we kind of touched on that a little bit and I know you've got a lot deeper rabbit hole around that. Cause this is a, a place of your greatest expression. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a really fun thing for me this year because my intention in this year for me 
has really been on focusing more on the being on the feminine. And so what that looks like is not, you know, being okay, not pushing so hard and realizing like how much we can actually affect the world when we are in this being state. And I think there's a lot in, you know, from like spiritual standpoints around, you know, um, abundance meditations and laws of attraction and this whole concept of when we are focusing on the good in our life, that oftentimes we start seeing when feeling and experiencing more good in our life because we're orienting to that. And so a lot of the feminine is really in that receptivity. It's like, I mean, the exercise that you share that you're doing at night around how, you know, what are the ways I was supported today? To me, that's like the perfect feminine activity. It's like, it's so amazing because it's really looking and saying like, you know, the feminine is about receiving it. It's about the, the masculine is more about doing and, and giving. And we need that reciprocity. We need that give and take that push and pull in life in order to feel balanced there. So really, you know, this age of the feminine, I think is, is largely about, you know, bringing in this other pole that I think has been lost in the world, but also in keeping the masculine. The masculine is good too. It's really about how do we live within this state of, you know, of feeling gratitude and receiving, but also in tasking and doing the things that are actually creating things in the world. Yeah. Yeah. So I just want to just confirm, I heard that correctly, because there was a little bit of a tech glitch there that, that what you're saying is that, you know, when we can have a practice of inviting in and calling in the feminine aspect of ourselves, because we have both, that we have, we have that balanced with the masculine, you know, have the, the receptivity, the creativity, you know, the women, women have womb spaces because we create birth babies, right? Like we create yeah. life through these spaces, right? But we can't do that without a sperm, you know, <laughs> and yes. so to actually be in relationship and have as much balance as possible in the masculine and the feminine and allowing them both to be very awake and real and active in our lives, then, then we have a, a, a more profound experience in life is, do I have that correctly? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and it's like that, what I mentioned earlier around the, you know, the beginning of the feminist movement around almost having to like put our suits on and go and basically do, go into the workplace and do man, you know, do, do, the work in a masculine way, which was, you know, I'm so grateful for the leaders that have brought more awareness and more equality um, to us as, as women in the world. And I think we're ready for the next level of that, which is, you know, really saying, well, how can we actually be in the workplace and be in our feminine, really be in this, you know, go into board meetings and have meditated prior and allow different creative ideas to come through and really approach, you know, the, the board meeting or the workplace from this creative inspired place versus like just with our spreadsheets and data. You know, we want to have that too, you know, again, like that's important, but what happens if we combine the data, the facts with the inspiration of the feminine? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's really important. You know, I, I, have heard, let's see, how can I say this? I've heard like, I heard, I was listening to a podcast the other day on biohacking and I can't remember who it was exactly, but they were like, yeah, you know, all these great things work and now we have the data to prove it. You know, and my first initial inkling was why can't we just trust that it works? Why do we need the data? And in our world today, it, it's, it's just something that, that kind of roots us into the physical right? So we have the, we have this, this trust in, in the intuition and in the inner wisdom and in the, in the, you know, grace. And uh, it, we live in a physical world and a physical body and a three-dimensional time-space continuum that we need to have solidarity in the physical world around the things that we experience. So I really appreciate the way you bring those together. Yeah, thanks. I, I really feel in some ways it's like, you know, it's a different parts of the brain, right? We can, I get, I sometimes feel that too around like, gosh, like why can't knowing just be knowing like, you know, and, and there seems to be so much value in that. And 
I also think there can be benefits from like a just, you know, programming the nervous system to, you know, from a, almost from like a placebo standpoint around, you know, we know like placebo is actually, I heard the other day on a podcast, placebo is the number one drug researched, you know, in, in medicine is, is placebo because there's so much research, right? And so it's like one of the most profound working things. And largely it's just like the thought process and the thought process really believing that something's going to work. And so that's where in my mind, I've seen like, oh, data can be so useful because I think it could, there could be something there from a conscious standpoint around getting the brain, the conscious brain on board with believing in, you know, the power of meditation or the power of thought or whatever it is because of that, that data. So I think there could be a bonus of having this placebo effect too, which, you know, is also wonderful. Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I, I agree. I, I mean, I think it's vital. I mean, it's so easy. Like, I think there's, there's obviously lots of different kinds of personality types, but we, we obviously see the people like me, I would prefer to not be in the body. I would prefer to be in, in my higher realms and just live there. And so for me to actually create in the physical world, I have to be in my body. I have to bring that information and wisdom down, be in my body, be in my pelvis, be in my feet, be on the earth, touch the dirt and create. Right. And then there's the other type of personality of people who are like, really in the body and they're not woo woo at all, you know, and, and to have them be able to see that, you know, to, I think it goes both ways. I think it's really beneficial for both, for both parties. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And another, I think, beautiful point is like, yeah, I think it's when you were saying like, oh, some people are more like in, you know, space time and other people are more in their body. Like to me, that's like an example of some people have you know, a little more of a tendency to naturally gravitate towards being and doing. And to me, it's just another example of like, well, we do need both of these things in the world. And there might, you know, for some people, it might be more natural to be in one place than another. And perhaps where it's not natural, that could be like an area where, you know, extra um, support or extra just awareness is so useful. Yeah. Yeah. So which one, which, where do you lean? Where would you say you lean? Oh man, I go back and forth. I think like <laughs> in my true essence of who I am, definitely in being, but you know, something, you know, I love, I love not being embodied. It's so lovely and free out there. Yeah. But at the same time, I also have um, a tendency to, uh, when I get really excited about a project, I can have a tendency to go so deep into like producing, 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 producing um, that I can almost forget about being. And so I have to really remind myself when I get excited about a project, like I can start, you know, staying up till two in the morning and waking up at five or sometimes getting up at three and working on, you know, my project when it's probably better if I wake up at three because I'm excited to work on a project to maybe stay in a being space. So I feel like naturally, like historically where I enjoy more is, is really in being, but, um, I can, I can definitely swing very far the other way if I'm not careful. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah. So I would love to hear your feedback on this. So for me, like I have to work to stay embodied. And for me, the things that help me do that are yoga, dance, um, you know, capoeira, uh, working out, like doing things with my physical body and going outside and being in nature. Like that all helps me stay in my body. What is it that would, you would say that helps you move, stay more connected to your spirit when you're finding yourself more in the doing? I mean, honestly, interestingly enough, you're using those things to stay embodied but certain stuff for me, certain, certain components of that actually help me more get into the almost disembodied, especially like being in nature, like being in nature is a really amazing space for me to feel like I am just completely merged with the universe and, you know, a deep sense of connection in nature for, you know, the perspective of how big the world is and how small we are and, feel so connected to the animals and the plants. And so nature actually really, really helps me with that. And then the other big thing I would say there is really meditation. Meditation mm. is like the, probably the number one when I'm like overdoing 
to have really helped me get more into the being. Yeah, 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 for sure, for sure. And I'm, it's interesting because I'm having this conversation with you and I'm thinking, what am I talking about? I am so doing all the time, you know? (laughs) (laughs) And I know conversations we have, so I know this is true. (laughs) I was like, what am I saying right now? But that's how I feel. (laughs) That's so weird. Awesome. Yeah. One of the things I would love to have this little conversation with you is, um, so, okay. So what you, you know, I'm, I'm very uh, into looking at the, the consciousness behind certain diseases and, and aspects of, of experience in the world. And um, one of the things that, you know, since this whole COVID quarantine, all the things, um, government, whatever, uh, all of that's been happening, like earlier on, I I was, I was saying like in the very beginning, I was like, wow, I bet you there's going to be a huge rise in autoimmunity. And I also believe cardiovascular disease will probably just shoot right up to, um, and the reason why I say that is because I think there's a lot of quote unquote broken hearts, um, right now, uh, that will lead to the chronic illness of heart disease. And then I also feel like, uh, there, there's a lot of people feeling like they're not they're not doing it right. They don't know what to do. They're lost. They're lost their jobs. They're, you know, can't go be around family. And, and so this, this has led to, from what I've heard, and this is just my experience, uh, some people going into the kind of the self-hatred, self-hatred, I'm not good enough, kind of the, the vein, the, the, the frequency that underlies from my experience underlies most, if not all autoimmune cases. So, you know, those are kind of where my minds were going. And I was just wondering if you had any thoughts around that about maybe where on a, on a chronic disease level, all of this experience might take us so that we can begin to keep our eye out and maybe turn that stuff around before it becomes a problem. It's, it's such an important question. It's such an important question. I mean, I think I think one thing for sure, just from like a preventative standpoint, um, making sure people are getting like very complex and advanced labs, um, you know, a couple times a year right now because of this. I mean, it's always good to do that, but I think right now it's like, you know, particularly important because I do agree, especially like in my, in my stand, you know, my mind, the autoimmune component, especially is what I, I absolutely agree with. And I hadn't really considered the cardiovascular standpoint, but it would make sense to me with the way the COVID affects ACE receptors and, you know, in the kidneys and all of that. So, um, so that would make, make sense to me, but I feel like the importance really is in doing this regular lab testing to make sure we're we're ruling out certain things. Um, Definitely the autoimmune component. I mean, I think immune in general, um, you know, I, I frequent, we frequently autoimmune is obviously like this, this regulation of like immune system working part of our immune system working in overdrive and another part of our immune system working in underdrive. But another component I even see like with chronic infections is like chronic infect, like infections that are things like Lyme and Bartonella and Babesia and all these other infections that are actually fairly common that people aren't testing for. Um, They are, with people with these types of disease processes, typically the white blood cell count is extremely low. So people already have a tendency if they have, you know, chronic hidden illnesses or chronic hidden infections to have this immune um, deficiency that is like above like from a reference range standpoint it's like still like what conventional medicine would say is normal but it's actually a little bit on the low side so i also feel like another thing we're really going to be you know seeing as a result of this could be the immune system you know either either being like from an autoimmune standpoint kind of on overdrive in a lot of ways but also an immunodeficiency where our immune system is just not working as well. And we might see situations where maybe we get infections or maybe we have situations where we have these internal hidden infections that our immune system's been kind of keeping in check and balance. Like mono is another, you know, example, Epstein-Barr, right? So many people have had this particular virus and then we just coexist with it until something causes it to, to, you know, spontaneously um, say rear its ugly head. And, and so that's another area that I really see that we should be watching out for. 
Mm, yeah. So that's so true. I didn't really actually think about it as a immunodeficiency, but if we think about like, what is our immune system? It's like our, it's our warriors that are on the front line waiting to attack anything that comes and invades us. And we feel like, I mean, I'm speaking for the whole world right now, but it seems like we feel like, uh, we're being attacked in every single way. Yes. And at some point those, those reserves will deplete and you won't be able to stand your ground. Right. So it totally makes sense. Totally makes sense. Yeah. And so, you know, one of the things I've kind of been talking about lately is, you know, we, we, we obviously want to boost our immune system so we can, uh, so we can counteract or or prevent these things from going further downhill than we want them to. And um, what I, what I commonly say is, and it takes more than just increasing your vitamin C and zinc. Um, How would you expand on that? Yeah, I mean, from an immune system standpoint, one of my favorite uh, conversations to talk about is Nagalase. So Nagalase is an enzyme that is created by all viruses. So all viruses will secrete this enzyme. And what this enzyme does is it actually causes our macrophages, which are a white blood cell, as I know you know, um, but the macrophages are a white blood cell that really work to fight infection. So Nagalase, what will happen, we get a virus, Nagalase goes up, our macrophage white blood cell goes down. And then that's a major problem because then we can continue to like get you know, other infections because our white blood cells are not working. So what's really, really wonderful is to give things that are actually going to help to reactivate these macrophages, these white blood cells. Mm -hmm. And what's been shown to do that really well is called a beta glucan, which is part of the cell wall of mushrooms. Mm -hmm. So mushrooms, one of the things that makes them such a great um, antiviral, antimicrobial is that they do allow these white blood cells to work better. Basically, the idea is that we have that nagalase that is basically secreted by the viruses. Mushrooms will actually cause the macrophages to activate and to work again. So we have this process where we have virus, creates, secretes nagalase, lowers our white blood cell known as the macrophage, and then mushroom reactivates that macrophage. So even in people that don't have a virus, it can still be beneficial to take mushrooms just because of their nature of their ability to activate the macrophages, which is such a profound white blood cell for fighting infections. So I take mushrooms almost every day. I think they're just a really great thing to have in the diet. Another thing I always just like to mention with mushrooms is some people I find are confused a little bit about if they have a reaction to mold um, or if they have candida or another fungus in their body of thinking like, well, I shouldn't eat mushrooms. But that's really kind of analogous to saying that if we have a bacteria that's bad, we shouldn't take a probiotic. Yeah. You know, so there's good fungus, there's bad fungus, there's good bacteria, there's bad fungus, the bad bacteria. And just because we have a fungus doesn't mean we shouldn't take another fungus. We just want to make sure we're taking a good fungus. Yeah, that's a really good point. Thank you for that. You know, and before, just I just want to kind of backtrack for just a second. I know we're closing in on our time here, but, um, you know, if you could just brief our listeners on what how you look at labs differently than their medical doctor? Yeah, I think it's such an important question. Like to answer this, I usually like to talk about reference ranges and how like as a lab, we come up with reference ranges. So for those of you guys that don't know this term reference range, if you get say a thyroid value, you're usually given a range. And if you're in the range, then you're normal. If you're out of the range, then you're not normal. So when we say reference range, we're just talking about that range of what a normal lab value is. And so when reference ranges were originally constructed with these labs, what they would do is they would get, you know, thyroid is a really easy example because most people know thyroid symptoms. So if we say we had 100 people submit thyroid labs and these 100 people had, you know, problems with temperature and problems with weight and fatigue and, you know, all these or extra energy of a type thyroid, but all these types of thyroid symptoms. And we had 100 people with thyroid symptoms send their labs in, we would basically say that 95% of them, the middle 95 is normal and the top and bottom 2.5 is abnormal. So if you're catching me, the problem with this is that when we establish reference ranges in medicine, for some reason, we're not doing what I think what anybody on this call would probably say is logical, which is actually basing reference ranges on healthy people. So that's a big problem with like, you know, conventional reference ranges is our range is like so big and it's really not looking at 
the individual and what a healthy individual would look like. So, you know, when people come see like you and I and, and people that do functional types of medicine, you know, largely we're changing our reference ranges to say, okay, this is actually what optimum is. And that makes a big difference because we have a lot of people that can be told that they're, you know, normal and they are actually not optimal, but it just depends upon what frame and what lens we're actually evaluating these reference ranges through. Mm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Have you read the book of Brave New Medicine? No. Should I? Oh, yeah, you should. I'm only about halfway through it, but it's about an MD who gets an autoimmune disease and heals herself from it, I suppose. I mean, I suppose that's where the book is going, but um, you know, I'm just at this point where she was like, okay, well, you know, my TSH is 1.7. So according to my doctor, I'm within normal, the, the range, but huh, I wonder if there's something going on because I'm on the far end of the range. Could there be a problem? And that's where I'm at in the book, you know, and I think that's exactly what you're saying. Exactly. Yep. That I, I'll check that book out. It sounds like it lays that process out very well. Yeah, it actually does. It sure does. Um, so, you know, two things, I think one, would you please uh, give our listeners just some simple little steps that can be done every day to dr dramatically improve their life? I know we've talked, we've talked a little bit about that. And then if you would also tell us a little bit about what the me medicine with heart method of reversing disease is, because those are yeah, those are things that are different than any other person that I've ever talked to. Absolutely. Yeah, happy to. So, I mean, one of the things that I would say is the simplest thing to do is, you know, is really commit to this daily routine. And, and like I said, there's a, there's a great book out there um, called Atomic Habits that goes over some of the concept of how, um, from a, a psychological standpoint, humans, we create change. And so some of the ideas around committing to that 60 seconds or whatever we can do on a hard day actually comes from um, that book. And that book is based upon a, a model of psychology called the BJ Fogg behavioral model, which has really studied this whole concept around the difference between doing, you know, adding something to our life that sticks versus adding something to our life, like a classic New Year's resolution. That's like, oh, this is great. And two months later, then we're back to our old habit. So I would really encourage all the listeners to really take an honest look and say, what can I do from a practice standpoint on a daily basis that I can 100% commit to even when things are as crazy as I can imagine and make that your goal. And if you exceed your goal some days, awesome. But that really can work to repattern the, you know, reprogram the idea around having success because every time we, we commit to something, we have success doing it. We get a little like dopamine hit in our brain. It's like mm. our reward centers in our brain are triggered. And we want that to happen because that's what's actually going to encourage us to come back to that habit. So, so you know, really taking an honest look. And if it's truly 60 seconds, if it's truly 30 seconds, great. Like whatever it is, great. You know, if it's longer, also great, but it's not a competition, you know, so really taking an honest look, setting that and then being very, very specific around like another thing that, you know, we find that where people fail is in not being specific enough for their goals, meaning, OK, I'm going to commit to 30 seconds of breath work. Well, OK, well, when are you going to do it? Where are you going to do it? How are you going to do it? What do you need in order to be successful? These types of things. So, you know, looking and saying, is it best if you, you know, set your alarm a minute earlier, commit to getting out of bed? You know, is it best to do this in the evening? Do you have more of an opportunity at lunch? Where is this daily routine actually going to fit into your life? And how are you going to remember to do it? So like one thing that when I was trying to get up and start my day with like running, like, you know, going for a jog first thing out the, out the door, I actually, my cue was actually, I would set my running shoes next to my bed. And so I didn't like, you know, it was like one of these things I didn't have to remember to run because I would put my feet down like, oh yeah, I'm running today. So same thing. It's like with, you know, if you're doing a morning meditation practice, do you, are you going to be laying down? Are you going to be sitting up? Do you need a pillow? How are you going to be warm? Getting your space ready so that you can remember and everything is there. And that really prevents um, the fallout. 
And so I would, you know, recommend either picking gratitude or breath work or, you know, meditation or all three if you can. But if you only have a short amount of time and that feels overwhelming, again, commit to what you can show up for every day. And then, you know, picking one of these things and saying, okay, well, if it's 60 seconds is your thing and gratitude is what you feel most drawn to, then making that part of your practice around 60 seconds, you're committed to, you're going to the gratitude, you have your journal if you need that right there next to your bed or, where, or wherever you're going to be. So you're ready to go. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Love that. Yeah. I know that put my shoes by the bed trick. Yeah. <laughs> it works. <laughs> It's so effective. These simple <laughs> things, right? You can even be tricks. mad about it. You know, you wake up like, God dang, I don't want to go, but my putting my shoes on and fine. Yes, you know, exactly. and then you get out there and you're like, yay. <laughs> Yeah. And some people I've even seen like need baby steps from there. You know, it's like maybe the first step is just putting your shoes on and that's your goal for a week. And then after, you know, maybe your goal week two is like, now I'm going to go take a five minute walk or a 30 minute walk or whatever it is. But for some people, like depending upon where you're at, maybe the first step is I'm just going to focus on putting my shoes on my running shoes on every day. You know, it's just wherever you're at is perfect. I love that. That's very generous. Yeah. Very yeah, generous. exactly. Yeah, exactly. And we don't, we want, we're not very generous with ourselves. Oh, and we want to have wins, you know, wins yeah. are what encourage us to keep going. So that's where I think the honesty about what can we actually commit to is so, so helpful. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. And then um, how is it that my heart is reversing disease? <laughs> So the medicine and heart method, we've already kind of talked about in pieces, but we haven't put it together and called it that. Functional medicine, mind hacking, behavioral design. And so it's really looking then, you know, holistically to say, well, as humans, how do we change our body? How do we change our mind? And thirdly, how do we actually implement habits in our life that stick? Mm, love that. And you, you help people, you like hold them accountable and give them guidance and all that stuff. Yeah, absolutely. So at this point in our in our personal clinic, we have like mindset coaches, accountability coaches, nutrition coaches. And so having a wide variety of coaches is really useful because some people sometimes will find people um, they need more nutrition help. Other people have nutrition, you know, pretty dialed, but their their mindset is kind of their, you know, most important part to work on. So we can kind of tailor with our coaches you know, what people need at various parts of their treatment, you know, process, or just, you know, even sometimes where people are on their health journey, what type of help they need the most. Wow. That's really yeah. cool. And you work with people virtually. I work with people virtually. Absolutely. Yeah. We're doing a ton of virtual. We were even virtual before COVID. So we were, we had both our in-person clinic prior to COVID and we were doing telemedicine back then. So we've been pretty, you know, pretty fortunate from that standpoint to be, you know, set up for um, doing telemedicine even before all this interesting stuff in the world started happening. Yes. Awesome. Awesome. So ladies, you can see that there's a wealth of information, knowledge, and wisdom here and grace and beauty and love all wrapped in a beautiful box with a beautiful bow. <laughs> so I would encourage you to reach out to her. How can people find you? So I want to, I'm going to put my number here in the chat, um, chat here. So it's 720-722-1143. Seven, so that's her clinic line. It's a textable, um, line. And if anybody texts just the word book to this line, we are releasing a book in probably about mid-February. Um, basically, it's a book on using the mind in combination with the body to heal from chronic illness. So I would really encourage you guys, the first two days of our book launch, we're going to actually give the ebook away for free. So we'll be launching, we'll be letting everybody know when the ebook is coming out. And if you guys want that information to be able to basically get a free copy of the book um, during those first two days of the launch, we'll basically email everybody when we have that exact date and email people reminders um, to, to let you know when the, you know, when that date is going to be. Oh, cool. So they're just going to text the word book, B-O-O-K to 720-722. 1143 and you're going to let them know when they can receive your free ebook. Exactly. Oh, yep. that's so great. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Trying to get the word out, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the way, right? Reach to reach as many people as possible. And exactly. then so if somebody wanted to see you as a practitioner, how would they go about doing that? 
So same thing, just um, that number they can call. Um, they can also go to, they go to our website, which is medicinewithheart.com. So I just type that in there. They, there's um, a button on that website. There's a bazillion buttons on that website that all lead people to the same thing, which is book a free 15 minute health evaluation call. So um, you can call us directly. You can book a free 15 minute call if that's something that would be useful for you. Either way is a, you know, a fine starting point for us. Awesome. Sweet. That's really great. And before we go, is there anything else you would like to say before we close out here? Thanks. I, I mean, firstly, firstly, thanks to you, Dr. Victory, for all this amazing work and developing this community. And I think it's just, it's just so important to, I think, reach as many people as possible. And to everybody listening, I think the final thing to say is that no matter where you are on your journey, no matter where you are on your journey, no matter if your step is super, super, super small, mm. every step you take is meaningful. And so I would just really encourage you to, you know, to remember that. And if it's a small step, who cares? The fact that you're taking a step in, you know, working with your mind and working with your body and working with transforming your life is amazing. And if you fall off the wagon and don't take a, a step, it's no problem, you know, just take a step today. And I think that's the most important thing to remember. Awesome. Awesome. I love that. Thank you so much. I just love being around you and just being a part of your experience in this world and what you're sharing. And so I feel so honored and blessed. And I am so excited to be able to share this information with our listeners and our tribe. So uh, many blessings to you on your journey and um, may, your, may your life be fulfilled and joyful every single day. Same to you, my friend. Same to you. Thank you so much.